Hello and good evening. Welcome to the LaSalle Public Library's virtual programming. This is Donna, the library, and tonight we will be hosting Master Gardener Natalie Martin with her continuing series of recipes and gardening. Um, tonight will be, I'm just checking here, appetizers, and her next program on June 8th will be main dishes. So watch for that and please uh, sign up for it. We don't have the flyer for that one up yet for Natalie's next program, but it will be June 8th and it will be posted very soon. Also, uh, there is another program between the two that are on your screen right now, and that is on June 15th. It is a special program from the Illinois Humanities Council, and it is about the um, life of Everett Dirksen, a key personality in Illinois politics and Illinois life. And we hope that you can join us for that one. So keep an eye out for the IHC program scheduled for June 15th. The two programs on the screen, Dickie Chappelle will be next Tuesday night. Please sign up for that. It'll be absolutely interesting program. Uh, John Garofalo, the author, has done tremendous research on this and I think you'll really enjoy the program. Also, Already on the calendar, look for Kate Moore, the author who had such a success with Radium Girls. Um, her new book, The Woman They Could Not Silence, also is set in Illinois. It is based on a true account, and I hope you can join us for that one too. And with that, I am going to stop sharing my screen and my microphone and welcome Natalie and turn it over to you. Natalie, are you there? I am here. Hi, everybody. I'm going to start sharing um, my screen here, maybe. Unfortunately, I was ready before and then have changed everything on myself. So there, are. now I'm ready. Um, I will uh, turn on my camera really quick for you. Hi, everybody. I will be doing uh, Natalie Martin, Master Gardener um, here in LaSalle County. I am going to be doing some hands-on demonstrations. Um, so, you know, patience with me. I hope you can see everything and please um, let me know if you can't see anything clearly or if I forget to maximize the screen um, to make the camera a lot bigger so you can see everything. Um, I know that Donna and, Ra and Rachel might have uh, mentioned it, but we are using a new um, chat or Q&A feature tonight. So instead of using the normal chat frame that we would, uh, on your screen you should see a Q&A frame, and that's going to be a little bit easier to read all the questions. Um, on my screen it's on the top, on your screen it might be on the bottom. Um, let us know if you're having a hard time finding that, but in the chat, if you can locate that as well, I did um, put some recipes that we're going to be making tonight, so you can feel free to take those home. Uh, what the reason I'm turn off my camera so my hand gestures aren't distracting to everybody, but the the what we're making tonight uh, is going to be appetizers. So starters for your meal. Um, these might be things that you could have at a party if you're if we're vaccinated and having parties again. Um, you can can make some of these things for people to grab. Um, and the goal is going to be that these are going to be things things you can grow in your garden and use to make appetizers. Um, so it's going to be a little bit of everything. I'm going to do a little bit of um, diving into how to grow some of the fruits and vegetables that we are going to be using tonight, um, as well as the, we'll do some hands-on demonstrations. Now, all of the stuff that I'm making tonight is, is oven stove free. So it's, it's assembling. We're not going to be cooking anything with heat. That will be, guys, we're going to get wild in our main dishes program in June. I'm going to try to cook some stuff on screen. So um, it, it could get crazy. It could be a total disaster. You won't know if you don't come. So um, we'll all find out together. I uh, have a nice hot plate. We can, we can make some magic happen. So uh, I'm gonna we're gonna be making some stuff with bell peppers tonight. Um, if you have never had a bell pepper or if you've never grown a bell pepper, I wanted to talk a little bit about it. Peppers, you know, all peppers are related. Um, they are going to be, uh, you know, anything from a jalapeno to uh, a bell pepper to those um, pepperoncinis that you have in your Italian beef, things like that. Those are all related. Um, and, and they all have very similar growing instructions. So if you um, grow, 
uh, bell peppers, you know, you're going to need similar plant requirements that you would when you plant jalapenos. Um, these bell peppers that you see on screen, they're three different varieties, uh, green, red, and yellow, and all of them are going to vary by flavor. None of these are going to be particularly spicy. Um, the A lot of times with, um, you know, jalapenos or spicy peppers, the heat lies in the membranes on the inside when you cut open a pepper, and I can show you on screen, I have some cut open over here. Um, when you cut open a pepper, you know, inside is going to be some membrane. That's what this is right here. And then there'll be seeds. And that's going to be where a lot of the heat lies in your spicy pepper. So even with a jalapeno or spicy pepper, if you remove that, that's going to remove a big source of the heat. Um, so you can kind of keep that in mind. With bell peppers, especially reds and yellows and oranges, um, they are not super high on the heat. They're very sweet. They're very crunchy. Um, so they're good to put in things. I put them in pasta salads. You can eat them on veggie trays. Um, I'll show you how we're gonna use them today, but they're a great textural thing. And then you can also cook with them. You can make fajitas. You can um, use them in sauces. Um, in our main dishes course, we'll be using them to make a sauce. Uh, so that, that's gonna be pretty exciting. So um, the as far as like what their space requirements are, you can grow peppers in a container. So that is something you can do. Um, when you get the really big bell peppers, those may not be as great for a container because they um, will need kind of a trellis to help support them because those peppers get so big and heavy um, that they'll kind of weigh down and, and kind of topple over a container. Um, because of uh, our growing season here in Illinois, peppers and uh, peppers should be started inside a few weeks before the last frost date, which was April 30th of this year, although couldn't tell it from the weather, could you? Um, or you can just buy the plants. And if you buy the plants uh, from the garden center or the hardware store, you can really put those in, you know, um, whenever you get them, as long as it's past that frost date. Um, they don't, they do not like to get uh too cold. So ask me why I know that because I planted mine too early this year, even though I was following what Farmer's Almanac said. Um, and then care. They like, like well-drained fertile soil. So um, you're with lots of water. You know, these uh, fruits and vegetables are made predominantly from water. So you want to make sure that your plant has access to plenty of water. You're watering it every day. If it's really hot, you may need to water it twice a day. Otherwise, you really won't get fruits and vegetables of any substantial size. Um, and, and you may, a lot of um, peppers like nitrogen fertilizers, so you may need to add some nitrogen to them. It just really depends um, on what your soil is made of and, and things like that. Um, you can, because they like so much water, irrigation is really common with pepper plants because they need that kind of constant um, uh, intake of water. I'm trying to keep an eye on the question and answer. I don't think I see anything, but I'll, if you, you know, pop in if you if you see anything guys. Um, and then harvesting, you'll know when um, the each pepper is going to be different. Green bell peppers, um, you can usually pick them when they are, are fully grown, which is like three to four inches long. Um, and then when they are ripe, they're going to pull away from the plant pretty easily. You can see in this picture, uh, we right here on this end, this is where the plant, the pepper is growing off of the plant. And that will just separate really easily from the stem when it is ripe. If you have to kind of twist and pull and yank on it, that pepper is not ready to go. Um, so you, you want to make sure that, that you're not pulling it off too early. Um, and then that way, if you, you know, you don't damaging the plant so that you can't, so the other things can grow um, back on that plant, you're not damaging it. Um, and then uh, with other co like colored bell peppers, like reds and yellows, they even do have oranges and browns. Um, you want to make sure that those aren't green. They will start green and then they will um, develop their color as their flavor develops. So you want to make sure that that these are are colored and nicely, you know, the color that they're supposed to be when you when you pull them. You don't want to pull them too early because they may be bitter. They'll taste more and more like these green bell peppers. So you want to um, make sure that you're you're being patient with them. So that's just kind of a broad overview of um, of what uh, of what it's like to grow bell peppers. Obviously, if you're going to grow them, you'll want to do a little research into what you've got. You can grow them in a raised bed. You can grow them in the ground or like containers, like I said, but you'll want to be careful about choosing those varieties.
And then we're gonna jump right over to tomatoes. And I'm gonna turn on my screen really quick because I'll talk about a couple different varieties of tomatoes. There's so many different varieties. I have two here. This is a Roma tomato. And this is, um, they call it like a tomato on the vine. This one didn't really have like a, like a fancy name, but this is like a slicing tomato. And this is more, a Roma tomato can be used for cooking. It's, it's flavor, but it's got a really deeper flavor. And it's also referred to as a paste tomato. And so I will cut it open, each of them open, and I'll show you what the inside look like because they are a little different. I use a serrated knife when I'm cutting tomatoes because they, um, that serrated will get to the edge and it'll slowly slice through it without um, pushing. Cause when you squish it, you know, they'll squish, it will push all the stuff out and it'll kind of mush the tomato and you want that nice firm flesh. Um, the, uh, this may not be the best example. We should maybe use a beef steak, but you can see how this, the seeds are, are, um, are kind of forming formatted inside here. I'm going to see if I can get a better look at it from the other. Yeah, this is better, but majority of this tomato, is made up of seeds and this this pulpy juice and that tastes great that's it it's awesome that's a perfect tomato for slicing or just eating things like that um but these paste tomatoes here these roma tomatoes their majority of their flat or their tomato is uh flesh so that's going to mean that um the it's just has it has a higher um flesh content it's going to be better for things like sauces or things like bruschetta that we're making tonight um i'm gonna get my tomatoes out of the way over here uh because it won't have nearly as much liquid that pools in there the seeds won't be taking up as much space so you um are going to want to kind of pick and choose what you grow depending on what you want to make um the we also have things like cherry tomatoes grape tomatoes um uh, looks like we have someone in the chat okay so you we couldn't see, you couldn't see my camera. I'll show again when we do a little demo. Um, I'll, I'll hold them up again so you can see them when my camera is a little bigger because I know my camera is pretty small. But uh, there's tons and tons and tons of different varieties of tomatoes. There's colorful ones. There's, uh, like I said, paste tomatoes, slicing tomatoes, beef steaks are your big slicing tomatoes that you use for sandwiches. Um, so really, you know, choose what tomato variety makes sense for you. I choose mostly paste variety tomatoes or cherry tomatoes, things that I can easily snack on. My family doesn't eat raw tomatoes. I'm the only one that does. Um, so I use the majority of the tomatoes I grow for sauces, tomato jam, um, salsa, and um, and then I'm snacking for myself. So you want to make sure that you're picking the kind that works best for you. Um, and then what what kind you get is going to determine when you want to plant it. Tomatoes, just like peppers, are going to be wanted. You're going to want to start them indoors, or you're going to want to um, buy the actual plants from the garden center and put them in after you know it's it's time. Tomatoes will need a trellis system, kind of like we talked about with the peppers. Um, the trellis will help hold up the. Uh, yep, my slide is the only thing on the screen right now. I don't have a camera on, so we'll. Um, We'll do a camera here in just a little bit. I'll, I'll save all my other little demos for when we, we start cooking just so that everyone can see it much better. Um, so the, you, they'll want a trellis for your tomatoes just because you want, you don't, the tomatoes when they get big or when they start to fill up the plant, um, they're gonna be heavy and you don't wanna snap that stem um, because the tomatoes are so heavy. So you can see tomato cages. We use some sticks and, and um, that uh, landscaping uh, tether, kind of whatever it's called, the tape, the green tape to kind of hold them up sometimes. Uh, we make little chicken, um, chicken wire cages when they're really little. Um, they're gonna need lots of sun and they're gonna need uh, lots of water, just like, uh, just like peppers. The tomato is made up mostly of water. So you need a lot of water to, to get those nice, big, juicy tomatoes. Whoa, my, my, I had spilled some tomato juice on my, on my mouse pad and it went crazy. Um, so, and then care, um, we will have pests, you know, you have tomato hornworms, things like that. There are pests that come and take care of tomatoes. There are um, funguses and things like that that can affect them. Uh, keeping your tomatoes nice and spaced apart, that really helps. Um, checking for pests and weeds and things like that every day, that's, that's going to be perfect. Um, and then, you know, you 
you, uh, when you're ready to harvest, you're going to start, your tomatoes are going to start off green, just like some of those bell peppers. And as the color deepens, um, the tomato will become easier and easier to pull off that stem. So just like with the bell pepper, the tomato will pull away from the stem a lot easier when it's ready to harvest. So that's an easy kind of guideline for how to know when, when it's wet or when it's wet, when it's ripe. Um, to, like I said, tomato hornworms, um, things like that, those are going to be things that are, are, const, are big pests and they will just chow, chow, chow down on tomatoes and both the, the vegetation and the fruits. So um, keep that in mind. Um, but tomatoes do grow really well in a container. You can grow them in garden. Yikes, my screen is going crazy here. They go, grow really well in containers, in garden beds, in raised beds. So they're, they're pretty versatile and you can get container varieties that are nice and compact um, if that's what you want. Um, and we'll move on to talking about watermelons. This might seem like a left turn, but um, we are going to be making a recipe with watermelon tonight. Um, and watermelons are going to take up quite a bit of space. Um, they're going to be a little more, a little different from the, you know, tomatoes and, and peppers kind of grow in a similar manner. They, you know, you need a trellis. They kind of stay in their 18 to 24 inch um, spaces, but uh, watermelons can be kind of sprawling. They can sprawl around just kind of like a pumpkin plant. Um, and there's a couple different varieties. What we have tonight are going to be seedless. Um, you know, seedless are still going to have those little white seeds, but they're not going to have those big black seeds that, you know, um, you use for seed spitting contests, stuff like that. Um, the, uh, you have like with with melons, you'll have to have a couple different um, seedless watermelons or self sterile hybrids. So um, they develop normal looking fruits, but no fully developed seeds. So that they you know they're going to be um, cross produced from from other plants. Um, if you want to pollen, you know want you want to grow fruit, you'll have to have more than one plant because. Or, because you'll have to have a, a seed setting plant and then a regular plant. So you'll wanna keep that in mind. Um, these can get sown directly into the ground. You, they're not a great container plant just because they are container raised bed because they are sprawling, um, but you can plant the seeds right into the ground after your last frost date, and then you can mulch around them and that's gonna help you know, without you know, rotting, keeping the weeds down, stuff like that. A lot of people will um, put down landscape fabric over, you know, they'll have the, their sprout come up and then they'll put landscape fabric all around it. So it keeps the weeds and stuff away and stops the root, the stems from rotting. Um, so big space takers, you know, one seed um, in hills that are spaced six feet apart. And now more than one watermelon will grow from that. You know, a couple watermelons can grow on each plant, but um, you know, you can, uh, you're going to need a lot of space if you want to grow quite a few watermelons. Um, weeds are a big problem for uh, watermelons. You want to keep them away from weeds. It's going to help, you know, that'll help the stems grow. That'll help the, the stems not rot. Um, and then, you know, it's, it's harvesting and, and selecting a watermelon. That's even hard to do in the grocery store. So I was going to talk really quickly about selecting and harvesting watermelon. Um, I choose a watermelon based on um, how heavy it feels. So I like to pick a watermelon that feels pretty heavy for how it, um, how it, how, what the size is. But as um, if you're growing them in your garden, uh, you'll look for signs, you know, like the the side that rests on the ground will go from white to yellow. And then the tendril, which is like the stem-like structure that, that you know, um, is it's, it's like a little stem that comes off the stem. It's closest to the stem. It's kind of a weird, watermelons are kind of weird. They have these multiple different stems that grow off of them, uh, but it'll turn from green to black. And that black, once that tendril turns black, it's, it's ready to go. Um, and they can be cut off. You're not gonna wanna twist them off, cut away from the vine. And, and then when you are looking at watermelons in the store, um, you know, you, 
a lot of people will thump them, you know, it's, you got, if it sounds hollow, if it sounds dense, things like that. Um, but the newer variet varieties tend to be more firm and crisp. So that thumping test, um, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't always help, but that like in this picture, you can see this, this spot right here, this is that spot where the watermelon was resting on the ground. And you can see how nice and yellow that is. The more yellow the, this spot is gonna be, the riper it is. So if you have one, a spot like this that looks very, very white, that's not gonna be a very good tasting watermelon. You wanna go with one that's a little bit more yellow. Um, so that's just kind of a tip if you're looking in a store versus, um, but I like to pick one that's, that's nice and heavy feeling where if you pick one up and it feels light to the touch. I always think that that's going to be kind of a, a dried out melon, not very, um, waterlogged. You want to, and watermelon are very, very water greedy. So you want to make sure you have nice water when you're growing them. Lots of nice sun. All right. I think, uh, and then a quick note about herbs. We talked about herbs in a couple other programs. Herbs are very easy to grow for, you know, for most of, in most uh, growing areas. Um, you can grow just about anything, any herb in a container. Um, some of them will come back year after year. Our thyme, our chives come back year after year, sometimes lavender. Um, we've talked about it before in here, but mint, uh, we're going to be using mint tonight. Mint can be invasive. So when you are um, growing mint, make sure that you're growing in a controlled way because it will take over your whole yard. Um, but yeah, there's lots of great uses for cooking them. Um, I, there's a link here and I've shared it before, but if you Google um, University of Illinois Extension Herb Directory, it'll take you to a uh, a listing of herb varieties, what grows best in Illinois, and um, you know what to how in their care instructions. So, um, quick note about that: we're going to be using basil and uh, mint tonight um, in our recipes. Okay, I'm going to get rid of my screen share. It looks like I have a comment. Um, this is going to be recorded, so um, the library will always put the. Um, the recording up on their website um, after the, can you, my, my screen has gone away. Where did it go? Show me my video. Um, the library will always put the uh, recording up on their website for everybody to view. And it's on usually their YouTube page. So I'm gonna try to tip down here. I've got a cutting board right in front of me. You might not see my face, but we talked a little bit about tomatoes. Um, I've got a Roma here. And this is like a, they refer to it as like a tomato on the vine. Um, I cut those open just to kind of show you the flesh amounts. This is a tomato on the vine. And you can see that the majority of that is taken up by seeds and pulp on the inside. Whereas this is a little smaller, but way less seeds, way more flesh. Um, so a, a, a lower seed to flesh ratio on a Roma tomato, which is why they're used more for cooking um, and preparing things like that. These I have sliced up here, mostly Romas. Um, and it looks like I might have a QA and a also. Is there a certain type of watermelon I prefer to grow? You know, I have not grown a ton of watermelons because they are such a big space taker and I have just a limited yard here. That way you can actually see my face, not just the bottom of that part of my mouth. Um, the, uh, the University of Illinois Extension has a guide to growing watermelons. Um, so if you Google University of Illinois Extension watermelons, they will have all sorts of different varieties how long it will take from start to ripeness, how much space they need, things like that, growing guide. So I definitely recommend that. I'm not a big watermelon grower specifically because of the space. Um, the uh, So just kind of keep, kind of figure out what works best for you. Um, some people choose seedless. Uh, that's going to come with its own, you know, trickiness. Sometimes when you, you have a, a cross high or a hybrid plant, um, they just don't grow as well in Illinois. So you just got to kind of keep, you know, see what works and what doesn't work for you. Um, we're making bruschetta tonight. I'm not sure if anyone's had bruschetta. Um, it's kind of like a, it's a sauce, but it's a dip but it's a bread topping. It's really just about anything. You could put this, uh, it's gonna be tomatoes and garlic and basil and balsamic vinegar, um, salt and pepper. It's pretty easy, but you can put it on a pasta. You can put it on bread, tortilla chips, pita chips, crackers. I just love bruschetta. 
Um, and what we're not gonna do is judge the amount of garlic that I'm putting in here tonight. Garlic is something I firmly believe that you have to measure with your heart. Um, I believe in this uh, recipe, they call for eight Roma tomatoes and three cloves of garlic. Now I have four Roma tomatoes here and three cloves of garlic, everybody. So, you know, it's all about personal preference. And if you are somebody, my family gets heartburn or my mother gets heartburn when she eats raw garlic. So if you are somebody that, that suffers from that, you can easily cook this garlic up ahead of time, saute it in some olive oil and then throw it in. Um, that would work great. You could use garlic powder if you don't want to use fresh garlic or it's too harsh for you. Um, you could use that, the pre-minced up garlic that you get in the little jar in the grocery store. So whatever works for you. But so I have about three, four, four Roma tomatoes in here um, and one uh, of these uh, tomato on the vine. I'm going to add all this garlic because, you know, I'm still here at home just working from home. So no one, no one's going to smell my garlic breath except for my family for them. Um, and then another thing that I tend to measure with my heart is balsamic vinegar. I'm not sure this is made from grape. It's a vinegar that's made from grape musts. Um, and it's usually aged and uh, it's just got a very interesting flavor. You can use red wine vinegar. Um, white vinegar is a little harsh. This would be a little bit more mellow. And I'm gonna add just about a tablespoon of that to this. Um, you can do more, you can do less, but remember that it is a liquid. So um, however much you add, you're going to have like that much liquid. So you just might want a slotted spoon if you add more. It's gonna be, you know, fairly acidic too. Um, so this is our garlic and our tomato. And I'm gonna add basil. Now I have just basil. This is from like the herb section because my basil is not ready yet in my yard, but this is a basil leaf and basil comes in a couple different varieties. Um, you can find, you know, uh, Greek basil and Thai basil and all sorts of different kinds of basil. Um, I believe that it doesn't have to say what kind is in our grocery store. It just says basil. So um, I wouldn't know for sure what kind we have. Um, Genovese basil is one I grow at home. Just as kind of whatever your preference is, they all have different um, uh, strength levels. I love the, um, lemony kind of floral smell of basil. I love the flavor. I'm just doing like a fine chop because I don't want big chunks of it. Um, I can turn this down here and I hope everyone can see. Okay. It looks like I'm not getting any flags, but, and we're just going to mix this right in. Now, when you're making bruschetta, it's nice to let it sit for a little bit. But just like when we were making that mint lemonade, when was that last month? You don't want this basil, it's not gonna be bad for you, but it will kind of turn brown over time and kind of potentially get a little bit slimy um, the longer that it sits. So I think like an hour is a good amount of time for, um, for that to sit um, before you eat it or before you have people over. Uh, I like to add a little salt and I like a lot of cracked pepper, but again, that's just something you measure with your heart um, and whatever your preference is. You can use white pepper if you prefer or none, um, whatever you like. So you can see, and you can scoop this up. Um, you can, like I said, make this add, cook some pasta when it's still warm, add this into your warm pasta so that you can, um, that heat the heat from the warm pasta will heat up the garlic and all the flavors and it'll smell really nice. It'll start to meld into there. So you can do that. You can scoop it onto toast. Um, it's really, you know, a really versatile kind of thing. So uh, bruschetta guys, super easy. The things that you could grow in your garden, tomatoes, the herb, the basil herbs, you can grow very easily in container. Um, garlic you can, but it takes a little more forethought because a lot of times you start garlic in the fall for harvest in the spring um, in, su in early summer. So it's a pretty easy thing. It's a way to use up some tomatoes if you have too many in your garden because you can make just about a, a lot of it, but it may not um, last longer than a couple of days because of that wilting spinach. So um, spinach, basil. So kind of just keep that in mind. The uh, next thing that we are gonna make, I don't remember what order it is, but we're just gonna go in my own order. 
because it's not up on the screen anymore. So um, I have some watermelons here. We're going to be making watermelon pizza. This is again another no cook. It's another summer, really fresh summer. This is just watermelon rounds. So you can kind of see I had the whole watermelon and I just took cross cuts. This one I didn't do a very good job, evidently. So it's a cross cut. You don't really want it bigger than an inch. It's got a little back over there but so these are just some solid rounds and then what i did is i cut it like a pizza so you cut it like a pizza you've got these little individual things here so i'm setting the scene for you so you then you'll leave it you'll leave it on your plate or your tray or your cutting board or whatever and we're going to start to put some stuff on there this is going to sound maybe a little weird to you for anyone that hasn't um hasn't really tried something with watermelon before. I love a watermelon like feta salad. You put big chunks of watermelon, I'm gonna cut up some mint first. Um, but watermelon and mint, they go amazing together. They are just, it is such a great combo. You can do watermelon mint beverages. You can do like a syrup with watermelon and mint. That's really good. Um, watermelon mint, like, like sure, like sorbet, that would be yummy. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our mint and this is just regular mint. This is just, it's literally called mint in the grocery store. Um, this would be the mint that would be the crazy invasive that might get out of hand in your yard. And we're gonna chop it up pretty fine. Um, when I'm doing herbs, I like to kind of bundle them together because tend, they can tend to, now they're all cut up, so it's not as good, but they can tend to go a little crazy. But um, if I kind of roll them up, it helps me chop them better. And then I can run my knife just across the whole thing, get it all in a pile. And then you can kind of see it starts to break up a little bit. So again, when we were like, just like when we were doing that bruschetta, we don't want big, big overpowering chunks of anything in this dish. So you want to kind of keep your mint nice and tiny, get my watermelon back up here. Um, so we had a couple different ingredients. This is a Mediterranean Greek, uh, watermelon or Greek watermelon pizza. So I'm using Kalamata olives and these are going to be salty, um, really just robust olives. If you haven't had a Kalamata olive, I highly recommend it. They're just, I don't know, they're just a very interesting um, different flavor to a black olive. If you've ever had a black olive, or if you're, if you're not a big fan of olives, this might not be for you, but you could just omit the olives and do the rest of it. You don't need the olives for this. Um, we're not going to be, besides our herb, our mint, we're not going to be adding any other seasonings because you could do some cracked pepper if you want it. I think that that would be a little overpowering. Um, but are, are we're putting some pretty salty ingredients. The olives are salt, are pretty heavy salt. Feta cheese is pretty heavy in the salt. So you don't want to add a ton more extra seasonings on there to combat all of those flavors. So this is feta cheese. I'm actually using a reduced fat feta because I bought it by accident, you guys. But whatever feta works for you works for me. Um, so we're going to be doing that. Um, you can put tomatoes on this if you want and kind of gives you that pizza vibe. I am not going to today, and uh, but you definitely could. And then you're going to put this mint over the top and it's going to be really fresh. You can make it literally right from your garden. You can grow your watermelons, you can grow your mint, and you can have all of this right there in your garden. And you, so then each person, when you're ready to eat it, you just pick up your little pizza. And you can eat it just like that. If you wanted to do this as a salad with some chunks of watermelon, absolutely go for it. Um, but yeah, so you've got watermelon pizza right there, you guys. If you wanted to do more like a dessert pizza, you could probably like chop up some fine nuts, do a little drizzle, um, maybe of a syrup, like a simple syrup, like we talked about in the, the last, the last one with that mint would be really, really yummy. So kind of, uh, you can kind of add the toppings, you know, just try some stuff out, have a little bite of watermelon with some different ingredients and see, um, see what you think. If you want to, yeah, let's, let's add a little, we got some tomatoes here. Let's add a couple of tomatoes to that and see what it looks like. Um, they said to finally dice them up if you were going to add tomatoes, just because again, you don't want, you can kind of see how I'm chopping my, I like to make long, I like to use my knife, my serrated knife, 
because I think it cuts nicely right through. I make all my slices and then I go through, I make these short little sawing motions because then it's not squishing my tomato down. Kind of got a weird arm motion right here because I'm in my tiny little quarters up here, but you can kind of see it kind of stays together and then I can keep all of those there and they make nice little cubes. So we'll take my, we'll take that and we'll spread them just like sprinkle them right over the top. Put it in the in the Q and A box if you think this looks gross. If you think you're excited to try it, I didn't. I wasn't going to eat it on screen for you guys just because um, I'm positive I would get mint stuck in my teeth. But it's really nice, fresh. I love a watermelon. Um, I think I mentioned watermelon balsamic feta salad. Um, it's just really fresh and herbal and beautiful for summer. Um, so that's a really great thing to try too. That watermelon and feta go great together. The saltiness. Um, I do know people who put salt right on their watermelon before they eat it. Um, just because they like that sweet and salty together. So it's definitely something that has existed before. So you kind of take those things and, and run with it. Okay. And the last one is, I think the most versatile thing that we're making. Um, and it's going to be stuff that you find all the time, but we'll talk about what we, we didn't talk about cucumbers when we were talking about growing things, but I'll talk quickly about cucumbers. I have two different kinds of cucumbers here. This is just your standard cucumber, and this is a English cucumber, seedless cucumber. There's a couple of different names. I'm going to hold them up to the screen and you're going to kind of see, this is again, like the difference between a Roma tomato and a regular one, the seed quantity, you can see there's still seeds, even in these seedless ones, the seed quantity is way lower in these seedless cucumbers. Now these are those long, long skinny ones. This is only a half, but it's long and skinny. You can get them at all. These are wherever you can grow these. And then this is a standard. And a lot of times um, those, oops, those seeds, are associated with you know why cucumbers make you burp. Um, they're a little bit bitter. So a lot of times when you're cooking with cucumbers or using them in things, um, they have you use the um, seedless variety rather than the, um, the regular kind, just because then you don't have that moisture from the seeds and things like that. Okay, this is gonna sound again, kind of weird, but we're making maki rolls and a maki roll is traditionally like when you go out for sushi and you get all those fancy rolls that have all the stuff in them. Those are called maki rolls. And they're, so they're Japanese. Um, these are, this is a, just a real, real different version of that guys. This is not Japanese in any way, but it's similar in style. But what we're gonna use is just straight up roast beef lunch meat. This is just, this is the store-bought prep, like, you know, the kind that you get in the refrigerator section. If you wanted to go to the deli and ask them, you probably want it like a number, like a, like a, like a three on the slicing, not thin, not shaved thin. This is even probably too thin. I'm going to actually double it up to use it. So if I can hold it up for you, that's about as thick as you want your roast beef so that it holds up. It doesn't, it doesn't run. What we're going to do is we're gonna spread some borsan cheese. And I'm not sure, um, this is a, a one I already had because they didn't have, this is one I had in my house. I meant to have a whole new one, but they didn't have it at the grocery store because of course we're still in pandemic times where we don't always have it. But borsan cheese is like a soft spreadable cheese. And a lot of times they have herbs or spices mixed already. And this one's a shallot and chive shallot. It's just a small, very mild onion. Um, they have dill, they have all sorts of, if you don't have borsan cheese, you can use a cream cheese or a hummus. Um, but basically we're going to use it to spread onto our roast beef. So go along with the journey with me. Now mine's at room temperature, so it's a little spreadable, but you can see I'm just spreading it on. I like, like, let's get generous with it. You know, like spreadable cheese, you're already eating it. Let's just enjoy it. So you're going to spread it. You're going to cover it up. And this is going to be um, kind of what holds your everything on. And then you get to get wild. I have some thinly sliced cucumbers. These are going to be those um, seedless cucumbers. Um, but I have some thinly sliced cucumber and some very thinly sliced, not very thinly because I'm not, I'm not a magician. Okay. Um, but just some thinly sliced uh, bell pepper. I have orange and yellow because this is something that you're going to eat with your eyes. You want it to look beautiful. You want it to um, tip me down here a little bit. 
you want it to look beautiful, but you want to, and, and, you know, like, oh, I almost forgot the most important part. And I got some spinach. So we're going to take our spinach. They, in the recipe that I shared in the chat, it calls for, um, watercress. We did not have watercress at our grocery store here. So I just got spinach um, and you can grow spinach easily. You can grow all this stuff easily. Cucumbers grow really well in our yards here um, in this part of Illinois. And so do uh, bell pepper, so does spinach. So you can just take that and then we're just gonna roll it up, y'all. We're gonna roll it up. If you're not eating it immediately, you can put a toothpick in it. If you want to have it for like a party, you can put a toothpick, but think about how easy this is. You just use that cheese. And, um, if you, it, you can just kind of rest it down here and it'll hold it together. It's pretty healthy if you kind of leave the cheese out of it, but if you use hummus, it's super healthy. And this snack, okay. When I first was trying to figure out recipes to make for this program, I tried this. And I thought it would sound so weird and it is so good. <laughs> I ate so many of them the first day that I tried them. And they're like a really easy snack. They're a really easy lunch. You can put this in a kid's lunch if they are a vegetable eating kid, which mine are not, um, which is such a, such a shame, isn't it? But it has a nice crunch from the cucumbers. It has some nice crunch from the bell pepper. Your spinach kind of holds everything together. Um, it's just a really great, again, I'm not going to eat it on screen for you because that's, I feel like just everything would be all over, but you could use Turkey. If you are, you know, heart sensitive and you, you know, are worried about beef, uh, Turkey or whatever lunch meat you prefer. Ham might be a little salty and, um, like, you know, very strong flavored, but I still think it would be great. And maybe not bologna though, but like, I won't judge you. And I really would love to hear if you did use bologna because I love bologna. Uh, I just don't know if it would hold together well. So you can see, um, but though we talked about like, you want the thick lunch meat, um, and because you don't want it to pull apart, you want it to be able to hold this together and then hum, you can chop it right down. Um, so you can make a whole bunch of those. You can make them for a party. You could, uh, again, send them in a lunch for someone, but I think they look really pretty. I think if you go to a party and you saw all those with little toothpicks in them and you, they make you want to eat them they look really yummy. Um, and you kind of it's not a, a chip or something that you might feel a little worried about. So I thought it was a really cool, interesting recipe, but that's, that's my last, that's my follow-up. You guys, I want to hear if you have questions. I want to hear if you're interested in trying any of the recipes. Um, you can put your questions in the Q and a box, um, or the chat. If you haven't, if that Q and a is a little hard to, to use, but, uh, but yeah, thank you guys for coming tonight. Oh, you know what? I'm going to jump really quick on and throw up our, um, our uh, Master Gardener information really quick. Uh, like I had said before, the uh, recipes are in the chat tonight, but if you are interested in learning more about the Master Gardener program, please head to the extension.illinois.edu site. Um, the MG slash MG is for the Master Gardener program. MN is the Master Naturalist program and our specific uh, website for this area is BLMP, which is um, Bureau of La Salle, um, Marshall and Putnam. Uh, we're all volunteers here. Uh, so, you know, we love to spread, um, spread kind of our knowledge about plants and, and growing things to you guys. Master Naturalists are the things that grow in the wild. Um, but yeah, so looks like we might have some questions. If you did, I know she is actually leaving at the end of the month, Meg is, but um, you can contact, if you use her contact information, it will get to somebody new and this number will get you to somebody that can help you get information. If you wanna know more about the program, this is 815-433-0707. And probably Barb, who's in our office, will, will help you get that information. Um, but yeah, it looks like we have some questions, maybe. Oh, no, just a thank you. Well, you're welcome, Sylvia. I had fun. I'm going to actually eat these snacks um, after all of this, which I'm very excited about. Um, yes, and I know that we had that question about whether it's going to be recorded. Um, yes, you can see me almost spill things on the internet for, from now until the end of time because those will be available uh, online. Um, I, I have a question I have a, for you, Nana. Yes, I can always depend on you, Donna. Well, you know me. Um, <laughs> regarding the watermelon, because I, mm -hmm. I love watermelon. Yeah. All kinds. Yeah. So 
and you know that I'm really a novice at this. Yes. So if well, we, and that, I said yes very confidently, but you are more more than a novice. But okay. So I have my beds, right? So I have I have my four by eight beds, and you, I can walk around them. You know, mm -hmm. I can reach all sides. Mm -hmm. So when we put the watermelon in, when we plant it, if we plant it around the perimeter, then will the vine, which I, I love the vines, I, but mm -hmm. I do know that they become a life, you know, form and, mm -hmm. and go sprawl pretty high. Yeah. yeah. So will I just train them to go around the outside perimeter, you know, the edge of the bed to, and, and does, mm -hmm. is that one watermelon plant that then generates how many watermelons? So just like with a pumpkin, it can generate just a, as as many as what we had the you know you have your first reaching vines um eventually those vines you want them to start spreading out because the just like with pumpkins the um the watermelons are going to grow off these side sprouts so you can take the end node and you can chop that off and it'll send out these sprouts from the side and that's how you're going to get more watermelons these otherwise it'll keep trying to seek and spread farther and farther but you want it to kind of um uh you know you want it to kind of spread out so that it'll it'll give you those watermelons instead of just going in multiple different directions as far as it can does that make sense it does so i i only grow one plant you can grow one plant i mean it depends on how many you want to eat because it's really hard to um preserve watermelon you know what i mean it's kind of one of those things where you got to eat it or it's, you know, you can, you can freeze it and make sorbet or something like that. Um, but you know, you want to, um, they all come, have, they all come at the same time. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and you, you don't want to, I'm just kind of just looking on my guide here to see if it gives an idea of how many watermelons per, it just more gives a size range. So it says that it, it doesn't really give it a range of uh, how many are on each plant. It kind of really probably depends. Those bigger ones are going to probably have less just because they're giving a lot of energy and nutrients to those bigger watermelons. You know what I mean? Okay. Yeah. And and I actually have another general gardening yes. question, and I see we have some comments mm -hmm. um, regarding the recipes. But another general question is because these the plants that you uh, focused on today are water loving plants and water mm -hmm. eating plants mm -hmm. so when are we watering are we watering early in the morning are we watering in in the evening we don't water during the height of the heat right yeah yeah exactly um i mean obviously if you're going to ask about the the best option for watering it's going to be a drip irrigation system that kind of you can turn it on and it'll slowly trickle throughout the day but that's not in everybody's abilities or you know or you know budget um so usually i like to get them like at like eight nine in the morning you know what i mean where they have the time to you have already gotten your dew you know off off of them and they can you know start to to dry out a little bit and then you'll know exactly how much water to give them because just like with other things you you don't want to overwater them if you if you touch the soil inch down and it's dry you need to give that thing a good drink so um and then in the afternoon especially when those 100 degree days um in the summer you might want to hit it again in the like like 5 p.m kind of time when it starts to cool off again okay all right um, it looks like you have some comments there. Now I know blue cheese spread sounds awesome for the, especially with the beef, the roast beef with blue cheese spread would be really, really good. Wouldn't it make the rolls with iceberg lettuce and cut up salad items like radish. radishes would give you such a great crunch. Even like you could do some like roasted beets that then have been like sliced or pickled beets would be really good in there cucumbers seeded tomatoes yeah iceberg lettuce would be a good crunch um you could also do something like um arugula would have a really nice bitter taste to it you could put anything in there and it would be awesome it's really good um i wasn't going to try to eat any of this stuff but i couldn't bear to look at that watermelon feta 
cheese on olives and it was so briny and so good and salty and it had the sweet watermelon it was really good and it was pretty easy to eat it wasn't super messy i was kind of worried it was going to be all over but it would be a good thing to have at a party did we miss anybody in the chat? I know we saw, I hope you guys were able to grab those recipes if you wanted them. Um, they are up at the top of the chat. You can go back and, and scroll through there, but. If and we anybody... will send them out, Natalie. Yeah. And the, okay, perfect, yes. Be on the website, so not if to you worry need me, about yeah. that. And we let still me know if you need me. Of course, for last time, we have those yeah. recipes also. And we're looking forward to next time. Have you chosen we're, any recipes for next time? We're going to be making ratatouille next time. Oh my, okay. So be, we're, be brave with me, folks. It's going to actually be a baked dish. I'm going to make some ahead of time and I'll show you guys how to assemble it and what the end result is going to be. But um, that's one of the things we're going to make. And then some sauces for some things like some grilled meat items and some other stuff. So I'm going to have to mute us because I'll be using my blender. Okay. <laughs> It'll get wild. We're getting wild over here, you know? We'll just see. We're seeing what works <laughs> here <Well>, on Zoom. <laughs> I do hope it warms up a little bit outside so the gardens can start yes. to grow. Yeah, it's a rough one out there getting going. And I hope everyone's gardens are still doing okay. I was telling Donna before we got going here that I got a little too ambitious and put some of my stuff out too early. So I'm going to be losing some plants, but we'll be able to, you know, get some more seedlings started and stuff like that. So I hope everybody gets a chance to get outside this weekend. I think it's supposed to be a little nicer and, and then we'll see you everyone in June. Okay. Well, Natalie, thank you again for a delicious evening. And thank I don't you. want to keep you from your roll-ups. <laughs> I have so many snacks now. <laughs> I, hope, I hope your family might be away for a few minutes so that you can just indulge. I'm just going to let them think that it's not over up here in, in my office. And I'll just be in here eating snacks while they're out there. So <laughs> have good. a good night, everybody, and have a good rest of your week. Thank you, Natalie, and thank you yeah. to everyone who attended with us tonight, and we will see you soon. Good night. Bye. Bye.